All right, now, open access, the society's role. Let's get right down to it. Angela Cochran. Good afternoon. Welcome back from lunch. This is the lull in the meeting when everybody's all full of carbs and you know, ready to take a little nap. But I think um, you'll find that we have uh, an exciting session plan for you today. As we talk today about the powerful business of society publishers, we cannot ignore the unique impacts that open access, public access, and open, open data have on society publishers. It's hard to argue against the benefits of open access to the global scientific community, and societies are committed to advancing science and the professions that they represent. Even a society board can get caught up in the open access um, movement before someone will eventually say, hold it, how are we going to make money on this? Because the truth of the matter is, the expectation of the society is that they will continue to make income, significant income in many cases, off of journals program. Certainly there are societies that fall within disciplines for which an entirely open access author pays model works. But this is not the case for everyone. Many societies count on income from journals to support outreach, education, and other mission-critical programs. Further, not every professional community supports open access, nor does every professional community have funds for open access. Leading us in this discussion today will be Will Frass from Taylor & Francis, who will talk about the Taylor & Francis ALPSP survey on society um, uh, society survey, which asked society heads, presidents, and um, editors about open access impacts and society engagement. Next, we have Emilio Bruna, distinguished scholar and professor, Department of Wildlife and Ecology and Conservation at the University of Florida. He's also editor in chief of Biotropica, the journal of the Association of Tropical Biology and Conservation. He'll talk about the challenges of supporting open science with a society journal that provides income to the society, for whom open access provides challenges and opportunities. Lastly, David Crotty, senior editor at Oxford University Press, will talk about the many new ways that researchers are disseminating their work via social media. He'll review the pros and cons of using these alternative metrics to measure impact. So without further ado, I will have Will come up and... So thanks very much. My name is Will Frass and I'm the Senior Research Executive at Taylor & Francis. In recent years, our research department has published the results of several surveys, including the results of the survey which we sent to our society contacts in partnership with the Association of Learned and Professional Society Publishers. The 2014 survey of learned societies built upon a pilot which we sent out in 2013. So that gave us the chance to improve some of the questions and then reach a wider audience with the help of the ALPSP contacts. So today I'm going to discuss some of the findings pertaining to open access specifically in a manner which I hope is more illuminating than this individual which you saw briefly just now when I skipped too far ahead. So to begin with, I've got a couple of charts that demonstrate the diverse range of societies who took part in our survey. Nearly half of those responding were from societies with fewer than 1,000 members but nearly, then a f nearly a fifth said that they had over 10,000 worldwide. And there's also representatives from a wide range of subject areas. So respondents were allowed to select more than one subject area if they felt that their society works across multiple disciplines. So the number of responses to this, the question at the bottom there actually exceeds the number of respondents in the survey because each sort of um, subject discipline was effectively a question in its own right. So I'm not going to attempt to add these up, but colouring them in green and red gives us an indication that that sort of num small number of SSH subjects, humanities on the left with quite a high number of respondents, is roughly balanced out by the large number of STM subjects in the red tail on the right. Okay, so who took part in our survey and what sort of responses did we get? Well, we sent this survey to the presidents, the chairs, the vice presidents and the journal editors of scholarly societies, some of whose journals we publish and some we don't publish at TNF. And separately, ALPSP also circulated the survey to their contacts. And this produced a total of 139 responses. Why such a low response, you might well ask. 
Well, in the five years that I've been doing this job now, we've seen the response rates to the surveys that we've been sending out start to decline a little bit, probably because of the increased number of surveys and pressure from other parts of business to, to engage in more and more ways. So I thought, well, what better way to symbolize these machines that are continuously bombarding us with messages than one of these delightful devices? And I've always considered myself a skilled operator of these, so I, I never get that message in the supermarket myself. But a colleague said to me, no, no, I'm sure we had to call an operator over. And I said, yes, but that was for an entirely different reason. <laughs> Whoops. So if each of these dots on the screen represents um, the respondents from Taylor and Francis and ALPSP, we can look at the breakdown geographically of the U.S. authors, um, of the authors across the world, with a quarter or so coming from the United States and nearly a fifth coming from the United Kingdom, same again from Canada, 15% from Australia, and a few from continental Europe, with virtually all the rest from the ALPSP contacts. So having established that we have got a broad range of respondents, what I thought I'd do is start by having a look at the balance of opinion to see where that lies in relation to the question when we asked authors to think about the overall impact of open access on their society. In choosing to sit on the fence, 29% said it was neither a threat nor an opportunity. And whilst one in five said that open access was a minor opportunity, one in four was saying that it's a minor threat. So currently, societies, well, one in 10 are saying that open access is a major opportunity for them. But those of you that can keep score will realize we've got 16% left to go who see open access as a major threat to their society at the moment, tipping the balance in favour of that option. So on first appearance, it looks like I'm saying on this slide, open access is more of a threat than an opportunity. But don't forget, 30%, those in green on the left, have seen open access, and they've said, that's an opportunity for us. And the single largest group at the moment, those yet to decide either way, are the yellow ones in the middle. So in order to explore these potential threats a bit further, we can look at the results of questions related to some of the issues raised when we ask societies what concerns them the most about the next five years. Many of the issues raised revolved around financial issues, with stability being the single most common concern. Having said that, the second most frequent comment was actually an image issue related to how scholarly societies are going to be perceived in an open access world. And in third place were concerns related to the impact of open accesses on society finances specifically. And it's that that I'm going to turn to now. So we asked societies how strongly they agreed or disagreed that in an ideal world, all research published by our society would be freely accessible. And unsurprisingly, a two-thirds majority agreed with this idea, with just 4% strongly opposed in the dark red bar right at the top. So to put that into context, we can look at the results of a similar question from an entirely different survey of academic authors conducted back in 2013. This was the first of Taylor and Francis's open access surveys. And there was a question asking authors how strongly they agreed or disagreed that all research output should be free for everyone to read online. Remarkably, despite these survey samples being drawn from different populations and conducted more than a year apart, two-thirds of authors also agreed, and around about 4% disagree. But the strength of agreement is a bit different. It's much stronger amongst the authors and the society representatives, hence the dark green bar is, is taller on the right. But then again, the question is slightly different, but it's, it's on the same topic. So nonetheless, this comparison suggests to me that our small sample of societies is broadly in tune with a wider opinion base out there. But then moving from the ideal world to the real world, where societies were asked if they'd be willing to earn less money from publishing open access journals, then suddenly we do see a rather different set of results. Just less than a fifth agree here, nearly half disagree, many of those strongly. So although more people choose the middle option, actually, than any other, either because they were torn between the academic ideals and the financial reality, or possibly because they felt we were presenting a bit of a false choice here. 
But it's easy to understand these results a little bit better when we look at the proportion of society revenues that come from publishing. So we just saw how nearly a fifth agreed that they'd be willing to earn less money publishing open access journals. Unsurprising then that nearly a fifth of societies in our survey told us that they earn less than 5% of their revenue from publishing journals. For 31% of societies, up to one in four dollars comes from publishing journals. About a quarter of societies said they get half their revenue this way. 17% up to three quarters. And then 9%, nearly all their revenue comes from publishing journals. This splits rather neatly in half at the 25% mark, half below and half above. So we've just briefly seen that societies broadly share the same ideals as authors about making their research freely available, but that financial dependence on the subscription journals continues to impede that becoming a reality for some of them. And publishers perhaps have got a role to play in using their expertise to help societies cross that bridge. So having looked a little bit at the impact of open access on society finances specifically, let's briefly look at the responses to questions about financial stability in general. We ask societies about the importance of a growing financial return. And unsurprisingly, that's important to just over three quarters of the societies we asked. However, when we asked about the importance of a predictable financial return, we see that this is even more important. The actual agreements jump from about 77 to 80, 84. So we see that this is more important. And if you notice on the bottom, the second chart, the highest end of the importance scale, in dark green, is actually outnumber those in light green, unlike above. And when we asked societies about financial return, both from publishing and then generally, half of societies report that returns are staying roughly the same, with a further third saying that they're rising slightly. And then to wrap up this section in the survey, I asked them con to conclude if overall they're optimistic about their long-term financial security. Just over one in four agreed that they were, and a further one in ten strongly agreed with this. So that gives us about 50% agreement, most of the rest remaining neutral. So after a long period at the bottom of the economic cycle, societies are settling for stability, a little bit more over growth, and indeed most are reporting that financial returns are steady or rising slightly. And looking to the longer term, societies appear cautiously optimistic. So what future plans do societies have for alternative forms of revenue? And where does open access fit into those plans? We ask societies, what are they considering? What are they not considering? And what activities have they implemented already across five key areas, which I've got across the bottom of the screen there? So launching new open access and new subscription journals is something that only a fifth say they've already done offering more continuous professional development and engaging in more public outreach programs has been more popular. But it's actually an increase in conference activity that's already underway for nearly half of those in our survey. But over half said that they won't be launching any new subscription journals. And over a third said that they're not thinking about open access titles right now. But societies are least likely to rule out the non-publishing activities. They've got the smallest red bars. Finally, when we look to the future, now we see that launching new subscription journals is on the fewest minds, but launching new open access titles is actually one of the most popular plans. Equally popular is expanding the range of continuous professional development on offer. And as we saw earlier, that turns out to be a smart move. That recent survey by Wiley of the society members, rather than the chair people and the VPs, and the editors, showed that the most valued society activity, second only to the journal itself, was continuous education and training. So hopefully this chimes in quite well. So launching more subscription journals is the least popular option, most ruling it out altogether, and many have already expanded their conference activity. So... Um, a few have already launched open access journals, but many are now considering that for the future. 
So the last of our topics on this slide here relates to two questions which looked at the role of societies in an open access world. We asked societies how concerned they were at the prospect of open access changing perceptions of scholarly societies. On a scale of one to five, the average score here was 3.2. So just slightly biased towards the concern end. But we also asked societies if they felt that researchers would have less reason to become members in an open access world. And we can see that this is, this is more positive, those saying that it's not true, in green on the left, outnumber those saying that it is, in red on the right. So finally, I think I've just got time to look at a slightly different issue. Sticking with that same scale, going from unconcerned to very concerned, that I just had at the top of the last slide, we asked societies about compliance with open access mandates. And I want to highlight here that pretty much a third in green said that they were unconcerned about this. So let's keep that figure in mind as we leave the society survey for a moment and look at the results from the country-specific questions in Taylor and Francis's 2014 open access survey. We showed authors in countries with significant, highly developed open access policies a summary of their government or their funding body mandates or acts or policies related to open access. So here in the US, this is, relates to the green open access requirements set out in the Consolidated Appropriations Act Obama signed in last year, to which 43% of American authors said they felt it would be pretty easy to comply with that. Back in the UK, the requirements are set out by the Research Councils UK, if you're funded by, by them, and they require either gold or green with very specific rules about the licensing and then the embargo period. And just 26% of British authors said they felt it would be easy to comply. And then set halfway between the two... 33% of authors from all across the European Union felt it would be easy to comply with policies requiring them to deposit their article in a repository with funding available for green or gold open access if they're funded by the EU's Horizon 2020 policy. So I guess the final take-home message for societies here really is to think about authors from different regions who may have specific open access needs depending where they're from and who's funding their research. So I think it's time for me to make way for our next speaker, but if any of you, you would like to see all the charts from this survey, the quickest way to actually access them is just to Google Taylor and Francis Society Survey, and it's one of the top results. I think it's a good idea to put it in quotes. Um, and I've also got a limited number of bound copies with me, which I'm hoping to be relieved of before my return flight. But for now, I'd like to thank you all very much for your attention. Thank you.